Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at Virginia Woolf's novel uh, Mrs. Dalloway. So we just carry on where we left uh, from where we left last time and we looked at the whole embodiment of Septimus Smith, uh, the war veteran who comes back from the battlefields and who's obviously traumatized and who feels uh, medically, biologically and existentially alienated from everything around him. And we're looking at the alienation and the cognitive uh, implications, the cognitive uh, uh, associations along with this uh, alienation and how it doesn't seem to connect to everything around him or anything around him. So he essentially becomes like a sheath, an insular sheath, completely insulated from any human connect. Now the passage, the scene which we will do now today in this particular class is interesting because we look at a, a certain episode which takes place in the sense of a certain action, a certain activity is taking place and we look at Septimus's cognitive response to it, how does he respond to it. Or how does it not respond to it uh, more specifically? So the scene in, at play, the scene in question over here is a skywriting aeroplane. So this is a time where skywriting advertisements were becoming big in London. So we have this aeroplane, this advertising aeroplane, which is trying to advertise for a toffee. You know, it could be any, any kind of toffee name. So each letter will be sent up spiraled in a cloud. Uh, so all these spiral clouds will form a letter and then together they'll form a name, a word on the sky which would obviously be the brand name for that particular company. And what that would obviously do is that will make it hyper visible. So everyone in London, everyone in that part of London would get to see it. Right, so the visibility quotient could be quite high. Now the skywriting aeroplane was obviously, uh, there was a sense of wonder, a sense of uh, excitement about it uh, because of the velocity, because of the visuality, etc. Now the reason why Septimus is so unnerved, uh, Septimus feels so uh, completely detached from it and also any attachment is a traumatic attachment with that particular uh, activity is because presumably the skywriting aeroplane reminds them of a plane about to bomb, right? So again, we have this entire continuation of the, of the war violence into the uh, civilian metropolis now and he seems to be unable to move on, he seems to be unable to have moved on. So he remains to a large extent as an interrupted subject, a subject whose embodiment is interrupted uh, by the trauma he experienced in the war fields. Right? So this particular section where is important and because it just dramatizes so spectacularly uh, the different cognitive response embodied by Septimus in relation to the other people's responses, everyone else around them uh, as just consuming the entire episode um, in, a, in a very visual way. It's like a, a happy entertainment for them. Uh, whereas for Septimus, it's a very gruesome and grotesque reminder uh, of the bombing planes which he had presumably seen uh, at the war trenches. It's just come out from the war. Okay, so this is uh, uh, Lucretia, uh, Septimus's uh, wife, trying to draw her, his attention to the skywriting aeroplane. And this should be on the screen. Look, look, Septimus, she cried, for Dr. Holmes had told her to make a husband who had nothing whatever seriously the matter with him but was a little out of sorts, taking interest in things outside himself. Now this one sentence tells a lot because Dr. Holmes and Bradshaw, uh, these are two doctors mentioned in this particular novel and they obviously uh, represent and embody uh, heavy masculinist medicine. Uh, medicine which is determined and largely uh, governed uh, by a very, very male sense of logic and rationality. And anything which did not come within that purview, within that radar of uh, uh, rationality, would be considered to be effeminate, would be considered to be hysterical, would be considered to be completely inappropriate. So it was decided by Dr. Holmes that Septimus had nothing wrong with him, seriously, right? So he had nothing whatever seriously no matter with him, but was a little out of sorts. He was just a little out of sorts, according to Dr. Holmes, right? And this being out of sorts is important over here because uh, that obviously underlines the fact that he was a misfit a uh, medical misfit in the eyes of this very, very masculinist medicine, right? So, and he had been ins instructed by Dr. Holmes, he's been instructed and advised by Dr. Holmes, uh, Holmes to take an interest in things outside himself. So again, this whole idea of looking at the uh, shell shock soldier as a uh, traumatized war veteran, as someone who's over introspective, someone who is constantly uh, absorbed and obsessed with his own self is something which was seen as unmanly 
So the unmanliness of septimus is something which is uh, becomes which is equated according to this medical practitioners with his um, insanity or irrationality, right? So the fact that he's irrational is equated with his unmanliness because rationality is equated with manliness in a very, very mathematical way, right? So those crude equations are something which informs uh, the contemporary medicine and the medicine that Septimus is subjected to, the medical science that he is subjected to. So in that sense, this novel, Mrs. Jalloway, becomes a very interesting reflection, a very complex and dark reflection of the uh, tyranny of medicine, the tyranny of biomedicine and how they was uh, meted out uh, to the shell shock soldiers, how they became the very, very unwilling subjects of that tyranny of medicine. So Septimus obviously becomes someone who becomes a victim not just to his disease but also and more importantly to the treatment given to his disease, right? And the treatment is something which victimizes them, which shames them publicly, socially, existentially and of course medically. Right, so that sense of being shamed, that sense of being told over and over again that you are unmanly, you are over introspective, you have this narcissistic introspection which is what the problem is, there is nothing else which is bothering you, uh, you do not really have any real disease. Uh, so the unreality of shell shock is something which was a big deal in London and England at that point of time. It was not really classified as a proper malady, it was just some kind of a mental aberration, uh, something which came from over introspection, something which came from according to this medical science practitioners, something which came because of the emotional nature, the morbidly narcissistic emotional nature of these people. Uh, all that was very, very unmanly, all that was very, very uh, problematically proximate to hysteria, which is obviously the female malady, something which came from the womb. So, uh, Lucretia Warren Smith, um, you know, he, she had been told by uh, the doctors of Septimus and nothing really is wrong with him and he should take some interest in things outside of himself, right? So this whole idea of over introspection is something which is condemned uh, by contemporary medicine. <clears throat> okay, so thought Septimus looking up, they had they are signaling to me, not indeed in actual words, that is, he could not read the language yet, but it was plain enough, this beauty, this exquisite beauty, and tears filled his eyes as he looked at the smoke words languishing and melting in the sky and bestowing upon him uh, in an inexhaustible charity and laughing goodness one shape after another of unimaginable beauty and signaling the intention to provide him for nothing, forever, for looking merely, with beauty, more beauty, tears ran down his cheeks. So again, this is obviously the, not the right kind of response, uh, notionally the right response to an advertisement for Tofi. Uh, he feels the whole scene to be very, very sublime and the sublimity, uh, you know, almost grips him with his beauty and that obviously makes him teary. Uh, he begins to almost cry, <coughs> tears run down his cheeks. So again, the whole idea of crying, this uh, man crying in a very public place in London, uh, that would be equated by people like Holmes and Brad Bradshaw as very, very unmanly. So the unmanliness of Septimus's response is important over here because that's exactly what is condemned by the doctors, by the medical practitioners such as Holmes and Bradshaw. It was Toffee. They were advertising Toffee, a nursemaid told Rezia. Together they began to spell T O F, right? So in other words, the letters are coming one after the other and together form one word. T O F toffee uh, and maybe they'll have a name as well and that's something that's the whole point of the advertisement to make it hyper visible and very very public. K R said the nursemaid and Septimus heard, this, heard her say K R close to his ear deeply softly like a mellow organ but with a roughness in her voice like a grass herpes which rasped the spine deliciously and, sa and sent running up into his brain waves of sound which concussing broke. So again, look at the uh, deceleration of cognitive response over here. Everything seems to be slowing down for Septimus. So KR, uh, you know, it, he hears so this KR, KR, it's so decelerated, it's slowed down, it's may become more loud perhaps. And that's obviously because of his very disturbed cognitive and spinal system, nervous system, which has been almost permanently destroyed by the war. And Wolf seems to be offering a very, very graphic description of cognitive absorption and cognitive reception over here. And we are told that, you know, she, he hears the voice of the, of the nursemaid as that of a grasshopper, which rasped his spine deliciously and sent running up into his brain waves of sound, which concussing breaks. So the waves of sound came running up to his brain through his spine uh, and, you know, and, and then the, and the concussions began to be formed and then they broke. And the whole idea, the whole um, activity over here is listened to a particular word which is being advertised in the sky and how that is responded and received by the uh, traumatized war veteran is what this whole episode is all about. 
right? So he's begun to get concussions uh, and the spines are delicious are sending out wa sound waves to his brain and the brain is receiving a sound wave, so it's concussions and the sound waves are then breaking in his brain. And that becomes a very graphic image, a very decelerated graphic image. <coughs> Excuse me. A marvelous discovery indeed that a human voice in a certain atmospheric condition, if one must have, one must be scientific above all scientific. So again, the word scientific comes twice. One must be scientific above all scientific. It's obviously a critique. It's a jibe against the uh, hyper rationality of science. So uh, a d discovery has been made apparently that a human voice in certain atmospheric conditions can quicken trees into life. So you know, trees can be brought to life. Trees can be quickened into life. They can grow quick up. Uh, if it is spoken to in a human voice in certain atmospheric conditions. Okay. Happily, Rezia put her hand with a tremendous weight on his knee so that he was weighed down, transfixed. All the excitement of the elm trees rising and falling, rising and falling with all the leaves alight and a color thinning and thickening from blue to the green to the hollow wave, like plumes on horses' heads, feathers on ladies, so proudly they rose and fell. So superbly uh, would have sent him mad, but he would not go mad. He would shut his eyes. He would say no more. So there seems to be an excess of senses over here, an excess of uh, sensation and excitement, uh, all because of something very, very banal. You know, this whole idea of the uh, uh, sky writing, uh, airplane advertising for toffee is something which is a very urban thing, it's something which people see every day. But to Septimus, this becomes such an excitement, uh, such an exciting event that you know it can't take it anymore. It's almost like there's a <clears throat> A complete uh, explosion of senses inside his body. His brain is receiving concussions because of the sound waves, uh, and he would shut his eyes. Now he could say he would say no more. He's completely shutting himself down because of the explosion of the sense explosion around him, and that's something which obviously can be attributed to his uh, damaged nervous system, to his damaged cognitive system. So everything appears to him in a different register, in a different cognitive register compared to the quote unquote normal people around him, the normal surveillance around him. Okay. <clears throat> but they beckoned, leaves were alive, trees were alive, and the leaves being connected to by millions of fibers with his own body, there on the seat, found it up and down. When the brains stretched, he too made the statement, the sparrows fluttering, uh, rising and falling and jack fountains were part of the pattern. The white and blue, barred with black branches, uh, sorry, black branches, uh, sound made harmonies with premeditation. The spaces between them were as significant as the sounds. A child cried. Rightly far away, a horn sounded. All taken together meant the birth of a new religion. <clears throat> Now, obviously, this is classic stream of consciousness technique that Wolf is using over here. Uh, and all these sounds seem to be blending together in Septimus's cognitive system, in Septimus's nervous system. And the blend of the sounds is interesting because that is beginning to form something like a new religion to him. Now, what does religion signify? Religion is obviously a faith system. Religion is something that he can cognitively attach to. So the only religion that Septimus is sort of attaching himself to is this blend, this bricklage of sounds. Everything is coming together in this very urban setting. And that is producing not just an explosion of senses, but also an epiphany in his brain. An epiphany, again, as I may have mentioned already several times, we're looking at Eliot's early poetry and also uh, the short story by Joyce. Epiphany over here is a neural mechanism, it's something which happens to you neurally. It's like a special electrochemical reaction in the brain where you get this light bulb moment. But also, epiphany can extend into something more existential, something more elevating. So, and in some cases, for instance, in Joseph Conrad's writing, epiphany can also be a dark knowledge, a dark negative enlightenment, a negative uh, narrative of knowledge. Right? So obviously, uh, if you take a look at how the word religion appears, something which is presumably and notionally mystic, uh, appears over here uh, through a different combination of different machinic sounds. So the car horns uh, shrieking somewhere, uh, a child uh, crying somewhere, and obviously this uh, sky riding aeroplane whirring around in the sky and producing different kinds of images and waves in the sky all come together and then we have these leaves and the trees and the branches all swirling in this London air. They all come together to produce an alchemy of sensations and that alchemy is what religion is all about. All taken together meant the birth of a new religion. Septimus said Rezia, he, he started violently, people must notice. So again, the very violent response to his own name, uh, you know, is something which obviously shows that he's a nervous wreck, something, someone who cannot control the nervous system anymore, something, or someone who's actually uh, neurally <clears throat> very, very challenged, very, very compromised, very, very different from the normative order. 
Okay, I'm going to walk to the fountain and back, she said, <clears throat> for she could stand it no longer. Now, this is a passage that's interesting because we also get a glimpse uh, of Razia's own alienation over here. Because first of all, we're told she's an Italian. So she, obviously, she, she's a cultural, political, and linguistic outsider in this London metropolis. So you know, she's someone who met during the war and, and they got married. But now in London, uh, she feels completely alienated, not least because her husband, uh, who's from London, who's, who's an Englishman, uh, is completely uh, broken. Uh, the level of uh, you know, reception, the level of cognitive response and cognitive uh, you know, unity. So, Septimus is a cognitive anarchy. It, it becomes a completely a traumatized uh, subject, an almost traumatic philic. Uh, he loves absorbing the trauma that you know, is still live in them, uh, in him and his body uh, through his experiences from the war. Uh, so, that obviously accentuates the alienation faced by, uh, by, by, by Rezia. Uh, and she needs a break now. She thinks of going away uh, for a while. Uh, to spend some time with herself. <clears throat> For she could not, she couldn't stand it no longer. Dr. Holmes might say there was nothing the matter. Uh, so again, there's a jibe at uh, this medical, um, you know, masculinist uh, medicine where Dr. Holmes is con completely convinced there's nothing the matter with Septimus. It's no serious matter that Septimus is experiencing or suffering. For rather would she that he were dead. Uh, she could not sit beside him when he stayed so and uh, stayed so and did not see her and made everything terrible. Sky entry, children playing, dragging carts, blowing whistles, falling down, all were terrible. So contrast the very terrible uh, you know, experience of uh, Rezia with the supposed sublimity that, that Septimus is facing, Septimus is experiencing over here. Right, so uh, and, um, it's very clearly told to us that Rezia doesn't, is not quite convinced with Dr. Holmes's um, uh, diagnosis of the situation. Uh, she's thinking that Dr. Holmes might say there was nothing the matter, but for her, everything was terrible. All the sounds around, all the sights around, all the images around, they all become one terrible combination of different things. All were terrible. And he would not kill himself, and she could tell no one. Septimus has been working too hard. Uh, that was all she could say to her own mother. So, you know, there's no rationale, according to her, for Septimus's behavior. And in some sense, uh, he, she sometimes wishes that he, he killed himself, he committed suicide, because he could never uh, put down Septimus's behavior to any particular rational, to any particular reason. Uh, and the only thing that she can say, only thing that she could say to her mother, was that Septimus is working too hard. That was all that she could say to her own mother. To love one makes solitary, she thought. She could tell nobody, not even Septimus now, and looking back, she saw him sitting in his shabby overcoat alone, on the seat, hunched up, staring. So that image of Septimus in an overcoat, uh, cut off from everyone else, cut off from this very busy London, sitting there, hunched up, uh, staring at nothingness, staring at blankness, and that becomes an embodiment of modernist alienation, especially you know, in the case of Septimus, alienation is quite medical in quality, because he's a war veteran who's just come back from the war. Uh, so he just becomes this immobile subject, interrupted subject, sitting on the bench uh, and staring, hunched up and staring. And it was cowardly for a man to say he would kill himself, but Septimus had fought. He was brave. He was not Septimus now. So again, the whole idea of masculinity is interesting because we are also told Septimus had been brave at one point in time. He had killed at one point in time. Uh, you know, he had fought a war at some point in time. But now, uh, you know, he's saying cowardly things such as he would kill himself. Uh, and that's, that's an act of cowardice according to the medical practitioners, according to uh, religious people. And that, that cowardice of Septimus is something which is contrasted with his masculinity which he exhibited during the war. Right, so according to Lucretia uh, Razia, sorry, uh, all this becomes a very complicated transition from a position of cowardice to a position, a uh, position of privilege to a position of cowardice. That is the transition Septimus makes. Okay. Uh, so he was on Septimus now. So again, the whole idea of he is not himself anymore is a very neural thing. It's a very cognitive thing. He seems to be more blank. He seems to have suffered an injury. Uh, and there are many instances where people, you know, who have experienced, uh, let's say, blunt trauma, or any traumatic uh, uh, disorder, or any you know, sense of shock, any emotional anxiety, uh, to be changed permanently in the level of behavior, the level of reception, uh, to such an extent that people who are very, very close to them would say they're not themselves anymore. So what happens when you say that someone is not themselves anymore? That obviously means that there's been some neural, uh, cerebral, existential and emotional change uh, which has had a complete makeover from the person's uh, former neural uh, and cognitive uh, uh, frame that has changed forever. Okay, so uh, 
So he was on himself now. She put on a lace collar. She put on a new hat, and he ne he even uh, he never noticed. And he was happy without her. Nothing could make her happy without him. Nothing. He was selfish. So men are. For he was not ill. Doctor Holmes said there was nothing the matter with him. So this is the third time we we've been told uh, that she thinks, and oh, no, she's just repeating in her mind what Doctor Holmes had said to her. Nothing is the matter with your husband. And obviously that is. Uh, part of the jibe against masculinist medicine because we clearly see the Septimus is suffering from a, a nervous disorder, from an existential alienation. But the medical science at that time cannot comprehend it, cannot gauge it, cannot calibrate it, um, because it cannot calibrate or quantify it. So we see this complete dichotomy, this complete incompatibility, this complete uh, non-understanding between the medical science, the medical people, and the sufferers over here. All right? And I think I'll give you a, a background to this as well. This is the time where British psychiatry was found completely wanting in terms of understanding, in terms of engaging with uh, trauma victims. And this is also a time where Freud and psychoanalysis became very important because the whole idea of making sufferers tell their stories, uh, making sufferers tell their dreams became very, very important at that time. So Freud and psychoanalysis, although is not really uh, considered universally uh, scientific today, it was very helpful at that time because the whole uh, activity of converting a trauma into a story, into a narrative which could be told, uh, you know, the whole idea of converting a dream into a story which could be told is something which uh, Freud, uh, you know, propagated and, and, and practiced at that point of time. Okay, so the entire incompatibility between the sufferers and the practitioners is something which has been dramatized over here. And obviously, uh, raised his alienation is even more because of a political and cultural and national, um, you know, identity as an Italian in London post First World War. So I'll just stop at this point and uh, the last bit is interesting because again it is mentioned that Dr. Holmes said there's nothing the matter with him. So if Dr. Holmes decides it's nothing the matter then obviously nothing is the matter. She spread her hand before her. Look, her wedding ring slipped. She had grown so thin. It is she who suffered but she had nobody to tell. So again the, the alienation of Razia is completely, is absolute away here and it's, it's sort of very tempting to look at uh, Septimus Smith as the only sufferer uh, the only male sufferer in, in London that point of time, but Razia's suffering is obviously medical as well as existential because she sees her husband suffer in front of her. At the same time, she's suffering because of existential and political alienation. And the slipping off of the wedding ring becomes obviously very symbolic. Her fingers had grown so thin, she had grown so thin uh, that her wedding ring is slipping off, which is very symbolic of the fact that her marriage is not very, very fragile. Her marital relationship is very, very fragile. So this becomes a very symbolic uh, reflection of her fragility. And we are told that it is she who suffered, it was she who suffered the marriage, but she had nobody to tell, right? So the whole idea of being cut off uh, from, uh, uh, from everyone uh, around uh, is something which is suffered by Rezia. But, and we are also told far was Italy and her white houses and a room where her sisters sat making hats and the streets crowded every evening when people walking, laughing out loud, not half alive like people here, huddled up in bath chairs, looking at a few ugly flowers stuck in pots. So this image of this very abundant, fertile, vibrant Italy compared to this very pale and uh, almost animic London is something which Razia conjures in her mind and that obviously accentuates the alienation as an Italian woman in a post-war London uh, you know, with a very, very medically ill husband who doesn't have any connection to the world around him. So you know, that, that entire experience completely alienates them existentially as well as politically and she feels someone who is completely cut off and she's the one who suffers but she has nobody to tell and she can only conjure this abundant image or the image of abundance in Italy and contrast that with the painless of London uh, that is the present time that she is experiencing and inhabiting. So I stop at this point today and we'll continue with this novel in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.